Indonesia is one of the most fascinating nations in the world. It has major resources, timber, minerals, oil, and agricultural products. Its culture has influenced the art and music of centuries. And its people are happy and industrious and proud of their heritage. On the 8th of July, 1976, while the people enjoyed their ancient dances, halfway around the world, at Cape Canaveral, a new age was beginning for Indonesia, because on that date, Indonesia became the first nation in Asia to implement its own domestic satellite communication system. With its geographic location, its resources, and its people, Indonesia has enormous potential. What it needs is more and modern telecommunications. A major national goal had been to unify the people by creating the world's most modern telecommunication system. It was decided that a system using domestic satellites would provide such services sooner and with less cost than any other means. This decision was based upon extensive studies undertaken by the Director General of Posts and Telecommunications and by Permtel, a state-owned telecommunication company. The satellite system was to provide telephone, television, and telex communications to every island and eventually to every village of the nation. To implement this decision, Indonesia contracted with Hughes Aircraft Company to build two satellites, the Master Control and Telecommunication Station for Jakarta, and nine other telecommunication ground stations. Hughes had already produced a domestic telecommunication satellite system for Canada and for the Western Union Telegraph Company in the United States. Hughes had also developed the global network of Intelsat satellites, all of which had a long record of reliability during space operations. Although based upon proven systems, the Indonesian task was formidable, primarily because of a difficult time schedule. The goal of the second five-year plan was inauguration of satellite service on August 17, 1976. To achieve this goal, the entire highly complex system had to be designed, constructed, and checked out in only 17 months. The design of the two Indonesian satellites was based upon those which had been successfully used by Canada and the United States. The satellite was named Palma, after the symbolic oath of the 14th century hero Gajah Mada, who vowed not to partake of Palma until his goal of national unity was achieved. Each Palma satellite would have a capacity of 6,000 two-way telephone circuits, or 12 television channels or any combination of the two. The antenna was a special design that allowed its beam to be focused to cover Indonesia and its ASEAN neighbors. While the Polypa satellites were being developed, engineering personnel were also building electronic equipment for the various ground stations. As this equipment was completed, it was transported to Indonesia by ship or by aircraft. Airplanes alone airlifted over a half million kilograms of equipment from the United States to Indonesia. Meanwhile, construction of the ground stations in Indonesia had been proceeding. The largest was the master control station constructed at Cibinong near Jakarta. This station was provided with a special antenna for satellite tracking and control, as well as another for telecommunications. The main traffic stations and the light traffic stations were constructed at carefully selected locations throughout the nation. In total, 40 ground stations have been built. These stations were equipped with fixed antennas aimed at the satellite. They were linked by microwave or cable to nearby telephone exchanges and from there into the existing telephone network. While construction of the system was progressing, Permtel engineers and technicians were being trained to operate the system. Key engineering and management personnel were sent to Hughes facilities in the United States where they received special instruction in many skills, satellite monitoring and control, orbital operations, and ground station operation and maintenance. 
In Indonesia, hundreds of engineers and technicians receive classroom instruction and on-the-job familiarization with the electronics equipment used in the ground stations. The task was a massive undertaking, but despite the short schedule, despite the problems of transporting material over a distance of 16,000 kilometers, and despite problems with weather that sometimes slowed construction, all elements of this program went forward on schedule. Even as the ground stations were undergoing final installation and checkout, the first Palapa satellite was being readied for launch at Cape Canaveral. On the 8th of July, 1976, exactly on the original date established, a powerful Thor Delta rocket launched Palapa into space. Four days later, after successfully completing the transfer orbit maneuver and final positioning, the satellite was safely on station, 35,000 kilometers in space, its antenna beam covering the entire nation of Indonesia. At last, the dream of Gajah Mada had been fulfilled. What does this mean to the people of Indonesia? It means first that an important goal of the nation's Repolita II program has been realized. And it means that soon, a wide range of telephone and television services will be available throughout the nation. Smaller towns and the outlying islands will receive the same telecommunications service as the major cities. Future traffic demand can be handled with new stations when needed. The new services provided will range from long-distance telephone and national television to educational broadcasting, both by radio and television. The achievement of this telecommunications goal has placed Indonesia in the select circle of nations leading the way to the future. Palapa, a gigantic stride forward in the development of Indonesia and for the benefit of its people.